So we're going to start. Hi, everybody. Thank you for uh, joining SOMAX, myself, today uh, for the second webinar by uh, SOMAX. The title today is Additives for Geomembrane or Geom HTP Geomembranes Additives. Um, for those who participated in the first webinar, you already know me and you know how enjoyable I am. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Matt Cornelier. I'm a res registered civil engineer in Canada. I am the uh, technical manager at Solmax and also innovation leader. I've been working at Solmax for three years now, and I've worked in extrusion processing for over six years. Uh, therefore, I'm not a chemical engineer, uh, but I do have some experience in chemical engineering. So that's why today's uh, topic, uh, I'll do my best to explain it uh, so that everybody is going to understand. But also, uh, I'll try to answer as many questions as you have. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, all your microphones are turned off. Uh, that's what we want. Uh, please don't turn it on because it's going to do background noise for everybody else. Uh, please turn off your webcams also. Um, if you want, you can actually see me if you click on the Participants tab. Uh, you're going to see me in the upper right hand corner. If you don't want to see me, that's okay as well. Uh, you just don't need to click on that tab. Uh, for a smoother experience, please turn off all other applications, Outlook, Skype, whatever you have turned on on your computer. It's, it's for you. It's just going to be, there's going to be less lagging if everything's turned off. Questions are welcome. If you have a question during the presentation, you may want to write it in the chat box and we will address it at the end of the presentation. There will be a Q&A session at the end. so. Uh, Feel free to ask away on whatever topic you want. And the, the webinar will be recorded uh, and sent to all participants. It will also be available on Solmax's YouTube channel uh, later on. So <clears throat> this presentation came about because we have gotten a lot of questions uh, on additives, on OIT, on HPOIT, on durability of a geomembrane. So we felt it was a good topic for a webinar. Uh, we're going to try to address as many as, of the questions that have uh, been asked. We're going to try to address also some misunderstandings there are about antioxidants, uh, especially OIT and HPOIT testing, um, and maybe a few of misconceptions about what they mean in interpretation of the results, and try to give a recommendation on the best way to proceed or what is the best uh, geomembrane for a given application. So as a starter, why do we need geomembranes? Well, as Kerner says, designed by application, geomembranes are meant to contain. So uh, what, when don't they do what they're supposed to do? Well, when there's holes, when they leak, uh, when there's holes, there's cracks, there's tears, seams open up, improper bonding. Um, and you can have a perfect material, you can have a perfect design, you can have a perfect insulation, good construction methods, good protection. Geomembranes, like everything else, is going to age and it's going to oxidize and the mechanical properties are going to go down. And when they go down, the risk of, of getting leaks and the geomembrane not doing what it's supposed to do increases. And that's, this is mainly the topic of the presentation. So how can we prevent this from happening? So why do we need additives? Well, polyethylene, and we're going to talk specifically about polyethylene, but this applies to all polymers. But polyethylene, because Solmax is uh, one of the largest manufacturers of polyethylene geomembranes in the world, polyethylene is a very common plastic. It's a very simple molecule, like you see uh, on the uh, on the slide. Uh, it's a polymer with ductile properties, which means it's got a yield point, it's got a break point. It's a semi-crystalline polymer, which gives it good mechanical properties and also very, very good chemical resistance. Uh, the chemical resistance also comes from the fact that it's inert. Uh, it's um, this means that the molecule itself doesn't have any uh, anomalies that make it react chemically with a given chemical. It's also an electrical insulator. And it's not readily biodegradable. Um, th I'll bring your attention on the biodegradable part. When we talk about what, you know, the question I get, how long will a geomembrane last? Well, the geomembrane is not readily biodegradable. You know, people are concerned because grocery bags are going to last thousands of years in a landfill. 
Well, when we say the end of useful life of a geomembrane, we don't mean that it's going to disappear. Uh, it's going to be there for a very, very long time. We're going to talk later on of what exactly we mean by end of life, but know that uh, a geomembrane is going to be there for a very, very long time, much longer than uh, what's specified. So why do we need additives if it's not really bi bio uh, biodegradable and it's going to be there for a very, very long time? Well, there are factors that are going to create, are going to influence the geomembrane and make it age or oxidize. UV, chemicals, oxygen, all oxidize geomembranes. And geomembranes, just like metals or, or even myself, we're going to oxidize, which means there's going to be a creation of free radicals in the molecules. So we add two types of additives to the geomembranes. Geomembranes, HDP geomembranes or LLDP geomembranes are made about 97% of the actual resin, HDP or LLDP. But there's 2 or 3% that's made of additives, which are carbon black. Carbon black is a pigment. It's a black pigment that's going to attract the light to it and absorb the, the light or the UV rays. So that the UV rays don't go and attack the polymer, it's going to be absorbed by uh, the carbon black molecules. We're going to put 2 to 3% of carbon black in a geomembrane, and the balance is going to be antioxidants. Now, antioxidants don't act like carbon black. They don't attract, uh, they're not sacrificial like the carbon black. The antioxidants act more as a band-aid or as a plaster where if a, uh, a polymer chain, a polyethylene chain is broken, the antioxidant is going to come and fix it. So to explain a little more, what is oxidation? Well, oxidation is the creation of free radicals in the polymer chain. A free radical is a molecule that when oxygen comes and uh, nearby, it attracts an electron from the, the atom. So the stable molecule or the stable atom becomes unstable, becomes a free radical, and starts looking for other atoms from other molecules around, uh, around it to steal it and become stable again. But it's a chain reaction and it's an exponential reaction. It's like cancer. Once you start having free radicals, it blows up and then it, 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 it eats up uh, all over. So you really don't want free radicals in your polymer because once you have free radicals, it's going to affect the, the, the structure, the molecular structure of your polymer, but it's also going to change the uh, properties, whether it's chemical resistance, mechanical properties, and that's where you might have holes or tears or punctures or, or stress cracking in the geomembrane, geomembrane at, a, at a later time. So how can we prevent oxidation? Well, it's antioxidants. And what are antioxidants? Well, when you have a free radical that's created, he's going to want to look for an electron from a healthy atom. The antioxidant has a supply of electrons uh, that it can give to the free radical so that it doesn't attack the healthy atom. So the antioxidant is going to give back the lost electron to the free radical, and then he's not going to start attacking the next one. It's a pretty basic way of explaining it. It's a little more complex to that. There's more phases to that. I'll be more than happy to explain those phases to you, but this presentation, we want to keep it within half an hour, 45 minutes, so that everybody understands. So we'll keep it at that for now. So antioxidants are needed to prevent oxidation, obviously, creation of free radicals that will deteriorate the molecule of the polymer and reduce the mechanical properties of the geomembrane over time. Tensile strength, puncture resistance, tear resistance, and more importantly, stress crack resistance will be reduced if the geomembrane oxidizes. When you think about it, um, in 500 years or whatever, when the geomembrane at the bottom of a landfill has lost all its antioxidants and starts creating free radicals, it's not going to tear uh, because of an effort at, at that point. It's probably more going to crack. So stress crack resistance is very important to evaluate. Uh, at a later time. So why do we need additives? Well, this is a, this is a graph that was developed by Swan and Kerner. It's a, it's a very known graph by a lot of people. For those who don't know it, basically what is rep represented on this graph and on the board behind me is that what you want for as long-term behavior for your geomembrane 
is that the geomembrane is going to keep its mechanical properties over time. The longer it keeps its mechanical properties, the better the product and the better long-term performance you're going to get. That's why we put antioxidants, to keep the mechanical properties. So in the aging process of a geomembrane, it's going to be separated into three phases when you look at the mechanical properties. Phase A is the antioxidant depletion phase. So in this phase, the antioxidants are doing what they're supposed to do, which is patch the free radicals. And as they're patching them, they're losing their electrons and becoming ineffective. So you're depleting your geomembrane of antioxidants. But while you're doing that, the mechanical properties aren't being affected because the polymer isn't, become, isn't being attacked by the free radicals. So you're going to keep all your mechanical properties at around 100%. Phase B, you don't have any more antioxidants. It's called the induction time. So now the free radicals are starting to be to create it, but the chain reaction hasn't exploded yet. So your mechanical properties haven't been affected yet, but it will come. You don't have any more antioxidants in the geomembrane, and usually the phase B is very short in time when you compare it to phase A or phase C. Phase C, now your start, your poly, the chain reaction has started. Um, the free radicals are created, and now your polymer is being, uh, the mechanical properties of your polymer are being affected, and they're going down. And once they've hit 50% of their original values, that's when we consider, that's when we consider the geomembrane to have reached its, uh, its end of useful life. So when we say, how long does the geomembrane last? Not, the answer is not, when will it disappear? The answer is, when will it hit, uh, when will the mechanical properties of the geomembrane be at 50%? So we put additives in the geomembrane to push back that 50% uh, loss of mechanical properties. So there are different types of antioxidants that we can put in the geomembrane. And all are different. All react differently. I'm going to explain how they react later on. But all are important. And uh, the compatibility of an antioxidant, a given antioxidant, you can't say that one is better than another. An antioxidant will react differently with a different resin. And by different resin, I don't mean polyethylene versus polypropylene or HDPE versus LLDP. I mean, even two HDPE resins from two different suppliers are going to react differently with a given antioxidant. Or even the same resin from a same supplier, may, in different lots to a, a lesser extent, might even react differently with a given antioxidant. So it's very important to understand that there's no good or wrong answer in antioxidants. There's packages developed for specific re resin. So there's four types of uh, antioxidants. The first one, hindered amines, also known as HALs in some in instances, because it's hindered amine light stabilizer, um, is, used, is used for long-term behavior, long-term protection uh, of the geomembrane. Um, it's volatile over 150 degrees Celsius, so it doesn't perform well over that temperature because it just leaves the polymer. But below 150 degrees Celsius, it's a very efficient uh, antioxidant to be used. Hindered phenol is probably the most common antioxidant, um, and it's also the one that has been used for the longest period for the, pro the protection of polyethylene. This one is not volatile over 150 degrees Celsius, so if even at temperatures higher than 150 degrees Celsius, it's going gonna, it's gonna to protect the geomembrane. For one, 150 degrees Celsius is about, uh, let's say, 330 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for our American friends. Second of all, you're going to ask me, well, why do you need protection over 150 degrees Celsius? Chances are you're never going to have a geomembrane exposed to those high temperatures. Well, in the actual uh, usage of the geomembrane, you're right, but when we're uh, producing the geomembrane, we're heating it at about 200 uh, degrees Celsius, so uh, it, it's well above 150. So it's very important to have those types of antioxidants. Thiocenes, on the other hand, we don't see much in geomembranes. There's a reason for that. Thiocenes, if you mix them with other types of uh, antioxidants, you'll, the, that will render those antioxidants uh, useless. So when thiocenes are used, they're the only ones that are effective in the geomembrane, and that's why they're not used as much. 
Fast sites are very important in the geomembrane for two reasons. You'll see it later on as a secondary antioxidant, but also in the process uh, of manufacturing the geomembrane, since you're heating it very high, it's a very good antioxidant at very high temperatures. So the first class of antioxidants is the primary antioxidant. Like hindered phenols, those are considered primary antioxidants. They, they're designed to react with initial free radicals that is formed. So as soon as you have a free radical that's formed, this antioxidant is going to come and it's going to give an electron to it, and the free radical will become a, a stable molecule again. So it's a it's called, it's referred to as the radical scavenger because it reacts rapidly. There's a lot of types of hindered phenols. Uh, they change they vary uh, from one another by molecular weight, number of groups from, per molecule, volatility, most importantly solubility in the polymer because, and this, this is important, um, let's say I have a glass of water and I'm putting salt in it. Uh, I put salt in my glass of water, I mix it, the salt is going to dissolve in the water. If I put too much salt in the water, the salt is going to deposit at the bottom. You're going to have the same concentration of salt that's going to mix with the water, but all the excess salt that, I, that, that I've added is going to deposit at the bottom and it's not going to be part of the salty water. The same thing with the antioxidants in the polymer. Each uh, resin uh, is going to have a, 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 a maximum concentration of antioxidants that it can take. And it's not concentration in general, it's with a given antioxidant. So the solubility of the antioxidant in a given polymer is going to change a lot, and that's going to have a huge effect. Because if I, I can put antioxidants, I can put a lot of antioxidants in my polymer, but at one point, the polymer won't be able to take anymore, and you're just adding impurities, basically non-effective antioxidants to the polymer that are not going to protect the, the geomembrane. Uh, it's not as if uh, the, the, the polymer was using effective antioxidants and had this reserve behind them so that it could use it later on. Actually, what's going to happen is that the excess antioxidants are going to migrate to the surface and are going are to disappear from the geomembrane. They're going to vol volatilize. So it's important to have the right concentration of antioxidants for a given polymer. Second class of antioxidants is the secondary antioxidant. Those are phosphites. Now, phosphites are very good in the process. People refer to them as, as uh, a processed um, antioxidant, but it's more than that. Um, even at ambient temperature, they act, but they act as a secondary antioxidant. So what happens when you form a free radical, remember earlier I said there's a lot of phases, it's more complicated um, than, um, it's more complicated than what, than what I just explained. Well, one of the phases between the creation of a free radical and stealing of the others is the formation of hydroperoxides. So let's say I have a creation of a free radical and my, my primary antioxidant wasn't able to, to fix it right away. A later phase, I'm going to create hydroperoxides and then the secondary um, uh, antioxidant, the phosphide, is going to come and repair the hydroperoxide. So a combination of a primary and a secondary antioxidant is very effective in minimizing the degradation as the two react in a synergistic manner. So having phosphites, yes, it's very good for the process, but it's also very good just for long-term performance of the geomembrane because it's going to act as a secondary antioxidant. The third class of antioxidants is the light or UV stabilizers, HALs, more importantly. And they're very interesting because when when UV creates, um, sorry, I'm reading a question from uh, Mr. Silva. I'm going to answer all the questions at the end, so feel free to ask your questions in the chat, and I'll answer them at the end. Um, sorry. So uh, when uh, we, uh, so when UV breaks a chain and creates uh, uh, free radicals, it's not exactly the same phenomenon as when oxygen does it. How? are very good at repairing the chains that have been broken because of a high energy UV photon. So um, you have your carbon black and your geomembrane that's going to attack the UV, uh, that's going to absorb the UV rays, but there's other rays that go into the, uh, that, that still attack the polymer and house are going to be very good at fixing those. Uh, this being said, 
if it's a non-exposed uh, application and it's a bottom of a landfill, for example, well, you're not going to have a lot of UV degradation anyways. And how's our good antioxidants with some resins uh, for just typical oxidation or chemical oxidation? Um, but like I said, it's not better than hinderdamines. It's not worse than hinder. Uh, it's not better than phenols. It's not worse than phenols. It's just a different antioxidant, and it's going to act well with some resins, and it's going to and phenols are going to act well with different resins. So halves are very good in exposed applications, but in non-exposed application, they are another antioxidant that can be used, and it's not better or worse. So how do we measure the antioxidants in the geomembrane? It's very important to know if we have some. So the first test that was developed, it was actually developed by Bell uh, for the polyethylene that was used to wrap around uh, phone lines. Uh, it's the oxidation inductive time of polyolefins by thermal analysis, commonly known as OIT. Uh, the standard test method is the ASTM D3895. We take a two milligram sample, we put it at ambient temperature, uh, ambient pressure, sorry. We increase the, the temperature to 200 degrees Celsius in a nitrogen environment, so that oxidation doesn't start. And then we switch it to, uh, we switch the environment from nitrogen to oxygen. And from there, we measure how much time it's going to take to have an exothermic reaction. When do we get an exothermic reaction? When free radicals start to be created. That generates, that, that generates energy, it generates heat, and the exothermic reaction. So OIT is measured in minutes, and it measures how much time it took for the plastic to start having free radicals or an exothermic reaction. It doesn't give you a concentration in PPM of antioxidants, but it's, it's an index test that gives you an approximate amount of, uh, of antioxidants. Now, there are weaknesses with the OIT test. We'll see them later, but in large, if you have HAL that are volatile over 150 degrees Celsius, well, you're, and you put HALs in, in your geomembrane, and only HALs, no other antioxidants, uh, you are going to have an OIT reading if you do the OIT test, but it's not going to be representative of the actual concentration of antioxidants you have because of the volatility of the antioxidants. That doesn't mean you don't have protection of, uh, within your geomembrane, because those antioxidants are going to protect the geomembrane when it's used in its normal environment at normal temperatures or even up to 100 degrees Celsius if you need, they're still going to be there and protecting it. So doing an OIT test alone might not give you a good indication of the actual antioxidants you have in your geomembrane. The second test that's done is the oxidation induction time of polyolefin geosynthetics by high pressure differential scanning calorimetry, HBOIT. This is the ASTMD 5885, we take the same two milligram specimen, but we're going to heat it, instead of heating at 200 degrees Celsius, we're going to heat it at 150 degrees Celsius. Now, this difference in temperature, now why do we do this? Because we want to look for HALs. We really want to know if there are, if there are HALs in the, in the geomembrane. Uh, if there's only HALs and we're just doing OIT, the reading won't be adequate. So we want to do this test because uh, at 150 degrees Celsius, we're going to have a better measurement. But the activation energy that's used to create free radicals is not linearly proportional to the temperature that is used. So the difference between 150 and 200 might not seem that big, but on a thermodynamic um, scale, it's huge. 50 degrees is huge for the chain reaction to start. So if we just did the test at 150 degrees Celsius, it would take forever before we start having uh, free radicals form. So to accelerate the test, what we do is we do it at high pressure, the HP and the HPOIT. We're going to do it at 3,500 kPa's. But another difference you have with the OIT is if you're increasing the pressure, um, you're not going to, you can't switch from nitrogen to oxygen at a high pressure. So you're starting with oxygen right from the start. So um, so that's going to bias a little bit the result, and we're going to see later on another reason why uh, the results are a little biased. But the HPOIT is going to give you a good reading of HALs and even of, um, of phenols that are present in the geomembrane. 
but it might not give you the, the phosphites that are present because it's at 150 degrees Celsius. So for one of the first questions I asked our chemists here when I started working at Solmax is which is best, OIT or HPOIT? And actually, it's a question that I've asked to many, many people, and it's a question that I've been asked many, many times. And the fact of the matter is, it's the wrong question to ask. You shouldn't ask it which is best, OIT or HPOIT. The reason why nobody agrees on which is the best is because it's two different tests that measure two different things. If I've packaged my geomembrane full of how, I have enough antioxidants to protect it for long-term performance. But if I only do OIT on it, I'm not going to have a good reading of the concentration that's in the geomembrane. On the other hand, if I do HPOIT alone, I'm not going to have a good reading of all the secondary antioxidants that I've put and that are going to give a good pre protection of the long-term performance of the geomembrane. Also, you'll see later on, the HPOIT test has, has a few details that make it a non at, not as precise test. So what would be the, wrong, or the right question? Well, what do we want to know? We want to know when will the liner start losing its mechanical properties? And that's when will I have when when won't I have any more antioxidants in the geomembrane? That's the real question. That's what we want to know. We don't want to know how much I have. We want to know when will I when won't I have any more? So how can we answer this question? Well, here are a few steps. First of all, you definitely need to evaluate the quantity of antioxidants. Now, the GRM GM13 says to do OIT or HPOIT testing, uh, which is good, but you're not necessarily going to see all the antioxidants if you do one or the other. You really should consider doing both. And if you say, okay, I'm going to test alone, only OIT and HPOIT, and that's how I'm going to differentiate my geomembranes to see if they're going to resist long term or not, well, that's not enough information. The OIT or HPOIT value in itself doesn't give you much information. It just says how much you have. But, and maybe, maybe, but there, there are weaknesses with the test that are not going to give you the right answer. For example, the OIT, you can't detect hows in it, or you can detect them, but it's not going to give you a precise reading because of their volatility. So if you do an OIT alone, well, you might not have a good indication of how much antioxidants and how efficient those antioxidants are. HPOIT doesn't differentiate effective antioxidants from non-effective. If I put a gazillion ppm of uh, antioxidants in my in, of house, for example, in my geomembrane, and I do an HPOIT test, it's going to give me a gazillion minutes of, of HPOIT. But the fact of the matter is I've put too much in my resin. I have a, I have a lot of, of ineffective antioxidants in my geomembrane that are just going to volatilize over time. So my reading is going to measure all the antioxidants that I have in my geomembrane, but it's not going to measure the effective antioxidants that I have in my geomembrane. Also, and we'll see in the next slide, there's issues with the induction period. If you look at the graph at the top, this is the, the Kerner graph uh, that I showed earlier in the different colors. You have your stage A, B, and C, or one, two, three here, and, in, and that's the red curve. And in the blue curve, you have the antioxidant depletion uh, curve. This was uh, developed by Bedran and Rowe uh, from Queen's University. This is what's expected. So you lose your antioxidants slowly up until you come to your residual OIT value. Uh, <laughs> The re what is the residual OIT? Well, if I do uh, a test with my resin, an OIT test with my resin, and there are no antioxidants in it, well, my, my, the creation of free radicals is not going to start spontaneously and have an exothermic. There's going to be a period. I can't have zero minutes of OIT. The minimum value is going to depend uh, on a few factors, but basically it's the induction time, the B phase or the stage two in my geomembrane. So the phase two is the creation of free radicals before it starts to explode as a chain reaction. So the same way, when I do my OIT test, when I turn on the oxygen in it and remove the nitrogen, 
free radicals are going to start being created, created, and when the chain reaction explodes, that's when I'm going to have my exothermic reaction. So it depends. Uh, Kerner in 1998 found that 20 minutes of residual OIT, uh, uh, measured 20 minutes of residual OIT. Queens, for, for, for this example, measured 0.5 minutes. Uh, at Solmax, we measure a lot of resins without any, um, without any antioxidants, and usually if you the range of five to ten minutes uh, is a typical OIT residual value. Um, so it's going to take five to ten minutes before the chain reaction starts a free radical creation. Now Queens, what they did is they, they also tested the HPOIT. And what they found is that the HPOIT values, the residual value of the HPOIT is much higher than the OIT. Um, the example that's shown here is one example. So this is one resin uh, with one antioxidant. It's it's not typical of all antioxidants, it's not typical of all resins, but it's one given situation in which the residual value was 60% um, more or less. Um, so the, the HPOIT value was 60% uh, of the original value. That was the, uh, the, uh, the residual value. There's an explanation for that. Remember I said that the OIT residual value is the uh, induction period? Well, like I said, the HPOIT test is done at 150 degrees Celsius. So to do an, uh, a test on resin that has no antioxidants in it, because even if the pressure is high, the fact that the temperature is much lower, it's going to take more time to create the chain reaction. In fact, Solmax, we found that most resins uh, for geomembranes, the, uh, if you have no antioxidants in it, the residual value for HPOIT should be between 200 and 300 minutes. So, um, so it's significant. Uh, so if I have 400 minutes of a original HPOIT value, when there's no more antioxidants in it, it might be 300. Now again, that's going to change from resin to resin. It's going to change from antioxidant to antioxidant. There's no clear-cut one rule, but uh, Typically, you'll see a much higher residual value of HPOIT than of OIT. So that's one weakness of the HPOIT when you're evaluating how long will my geomembrane last. If I'm thinking that I have 400 minutes of, of HPOIT in my geomembrane, and after aging, I'm at 300, I'm say, oh, I'm still okay. I still have 75% of my antioxidants in it. Well, that may be a false assessment because maybe it's zero, the value. Maybe you don't have any more antioxidants in it. And in fact, at Solmax a few years ago, we received a sample from a, from a project. Uh, the material was completely oxidized. There was no more. Uh, the mechanical properties were down. It was very brittle. But there were still 300 minutes of HPOIT uh, that was measured on that sample. So beware of the residual value of the HPOIT. So, you know how much you have at the beginning. What you want to know is when won't I have any more antioxidants. To do that, you need to know your depletion rate. Now, GSC, a competitor of, of Solmax, published a technical note a few months ago that was very interesting on the topic, and I encourage anybody here to go and read it. Um, I'm, you know, it's a competitor, but they, they do good stuff too. Um, and in their study, they studied two different geomembranes that had very different uh, HPOIT uh, measurements of antioxidants. Uh, from their chart, their high performance had about 500 minutes of HPOIT initial value, and the competitive product had about 2,500 minutes of HPOIT value. Now, because of the high depletion rate of the 2,500 minutes, um, after 200 days of oven aging at 85 degrees Celsius, there was more antioxidants left in the uh, high-performance GSC than there was in the competitive product. Now this again, just like the Queen study, this is one situation that's one resin with one uh, antioxidant in one environment. It's not a generality. You could have a 2,500 minute HPOIT value with very low depletion rate, and that would be even better. Uh, so it's not to say that because you have high HPOIT values that it's not good. It's just to say, beware of big numbers. You really need to analyze the depletion rate. How do you do that? 
first of all, the depletion rates affect, you have to understand what affects the depletion rate. First of all, the pressure. If I have a high pressure on my geomembrane, my antioxidants um, are going to be are going to be forced out of the geomembrane at a higher rate. So you're going to have a higher depletion rate. You're going to have less effective antioxidants and more ineffective antioxidants. So they're going to leave the geomembrane. Second one is the medium. This is uh, this is actually very obvious. Uh, oxidation. If I take oxidation of a metal, we call it rust. Well, if I put a nail in water and leave a nail in the air, it's going to rust much faster in uh, water than in air. So if I'm, what's going to affect the depletion rate? So either by there's two modes of depletion. One, the antioxidant leaving the geomembrane because it was ineffective, or the antioxidant being used in the geomembrane to protect. If there's more oxygen and and in water, there's a lot of a lot of oxygen, and it, it's washed away, so it's very aggressive. Well, the depletion rate of my antioxidants in the liquid in general will be higher than in air. Temperature, we saw it earlier. Temperature is an accelerator of oxidation. So the higher the temperature, the the quicker the oxidation is going to happen. The quicker the depletion rate of my geom of my antioxidants. Thickness of the geomembrane. This is interesting. This is a fact that's often uh, overlooked uh, by some. If I do the OIT and HPOIT test, it's a two milligram sample. And it's a two milligram sample, whether it's a 40 mil or an 80 mil geomembrane or a one millimeter or two millimeter geomembrane, it's still gonna be a two milligram sample. So when I do my OIT test, my reading on both, whether it's a 40 mil or an 80 mil, is gonna be the same. My reading of HPOIT value is the same. However, when I do uh, an, accelerated, an accelerated aging test and I do the test, my thicker geomembrane is going to retain more antioxidants than my thinner one. And therefore, the thickness of a geomembrane has an effect on the depletion rate of the, geo, uh, uh, of the antioxidants. Like we talked about earlier, the type of additives is also going to have uh, an impact. The type of type of resin is also going to have uh, an impact. The combination of both, the compatibility of a given antioxidant with a given resin is going to have a huge effect on the depletion rate. The molecular weight of the additives, you can have the same additive, but with different molecular weights, is going to have different uh, depletion rate uh, differences. And like we spoke about earlier, solubility of additive with the resin is very important to consider. The more soluble uh, an additive is in a resin, the more effective the, it's going to be and the, the slower depletion rate you're going to have. So with all this known, um, there's two types of standard accelerated aging methods that are used, typically used on all MQC. Oven aging and UV aging. Uh, oven aging, basically, you put a sample at 85 degrees Celsius for 90 days. You do an OIT and HPOIT test before. You do an OIT and HPOIT test after. And you measure. Uh, the, uh, the sample has to retain a certain percentage of the initial antioxidant. UV aging, the same thing. Now, the question is, if I have, for example, the oven aging says you need to retain um, 80% of your HPOIT. Well, if I had 400 minutes of initial HPOIT and the residual value is 300, that means as per the 400, I can only lose 25%. So I won't have any more antioxidants in my geomembrane if I, if I lose 25%, yet the GM13 says you shouldn't lose more than 80, uh, than 20% after 90 days. On the same token, I can have 2,000 minutes uh, of it and have a residual value of 300, and then the difference is much, uh, you can lose a lot more. Uh, so it, being able to retain those uh, those 80% is very important. So just understand the different tests and what they actually mean. And through our recommendations later on, hopefully you'll you'll have a better idea of how to interpret those. So you've aged the material, you've tested before, you've tested after uh, the depletion. Also, sorry about that. Quick note on accelerated aging. Now, I don't want to pinpoint anybody here, but um, beware of the, the test results of oven aging. 
If you look at the graph on the right, the one from GSD, after 90 days, remember an accelerated aging of an aging test is 90 days. After 90 days, there was still a lot of antioxidants in both materials, both the competitors and GSD. If you look on the graph on the left, if you still have antioxidants, you're in phase A. Therefore, if you are in phase A, your mechanical properties should hover around 100%. Some manufacturers on their technical data sheet specify the mechanical properties retained after 90 days of oven aging. Well, for sure they're gonna be around 100%. There's still antioxidants left. That's not what you wanna measure. What you wanna measure after oven aging is how many antioxidants have I retained in my geomembrane, not how, how much mechanical properties have I retained. Also, if you look at the graph on the left, T85, 75, 65, 55, the higher the temperature, the, the shorter lifespan you're going to have with your geomembrane because the depletion of antioxidants happens like at a higher rate at high temperatures. So make sure those, they are standard test methods, um, both the oven aging and UV aging tests. Make sure that they're done as per the standard test method. They're not done at a lower temperature, for example. So just beware and, and read the fine print. So <clears throat> once I have my original value, I have my uh, later value uh, after accelerated aging, what can I do with that? Well, Kerner uh, has developed a, um, a formula for this, uh, which is going to evaluate the depletion rate. So um, if P is my initial value of OIT, and OIT is my at time T value of OIT, and I have T, which is how much time it took to age, I'm able to identify S, which is my de antioxidant depletion rate. So with the S, what can I do with this information? <clears throat> well, I'm able to identify when won't I have any more antioxidants. So I'm able to say, uh, P, remember, was my original OIT value. OIT is my value at time T, and S is my depletion rate. I'm able to find T. Now, what's important here is the LN of OIT shouldn't be zero. It should be your residual value, because if my lowest HPOIT value is going to be 300 minutes, then I should compare 400 to 300 minutes to find T. If I put zero, I'm going to get a false reading on how much time it's actually going to last. This is very important to consider the residual OIT and HPOIT values. Now, you're going to ask me, oh, and by the way, before you ask me, Solmax did a study a few years ago, and we compared three geomembranes that all met the GRI GM13. They all did. And we evaluated through the depletion, the original uh, val uh, level of uh, antioxidants in it and the depletion rate, how much time they would theoretically last in a given environment. Um, now, uh, the years, it, it was a very harsh environment, but they were all GM13 uh, geomembranes. And the geomembrane that had the highest HPOIT value had the highest depletion rate as well and was the one that lasted uh, the, the shortest period of time, whereas the two other ones had about the same HPOIT values but had completely different depletion rate and uh, lasted much longer. One of them was about four times more. So um, back to my original question. Uh, well, I'm going to get there. So uh, if durability of the geomembrane is a legitimate concern for you, um, Solmax recommends to obviously do OIT and HPOIT tests and do accelerated aging. But like you saw, depletion rate is going to be affected by different factors that aren't necessarily considered in the standard accelerated aging test. For example, the medium in which it is. If it's in a liquid, and usually geomembranes are going to contain a liquid, it might be uh, interesting to do an accelerated aging in water. Uh, that's going to give you a better indication of the depletion rate. Some antioxidants, in combination with a given resin, are going to be more resistant to, to the depletion of antioxidants in the liquid than others. Also, if you're going to contain a very harsh chemical, 
we may want to do an accelerated aging of that within that chemical. That's also going to give you a better indication of the of the depletion rate. You want to do the uh, the accelerated aging in the proper conditions. Like I said, temperature is very important. Um, if you do it at the at a high temperature, you're going to have a, a better reading. And and what's important here is really to have apples to apples. Somebody's going to do an oven aging at 85, and somebody else is going to do it at 80. Well, obviously, the results of the one at 80 are going to be better just because the activation energy at high temperature is much more important than at lower temperature. You want to perform accelerated aging long enough to find the antioxidant depletion plateau or work with your manufacturer to find the virgin resin residual value. What does this mean? So like I said, you want to know what the residual value is to be able to know when won't you have any more uh, antioxidants. Well, there's two ways of doing it. Either you do your test, your accelerated aging test long enough so you hit the plateau. That can be the standard day of an aging test is 90 days. It can be 100 days. It can be 200 days. It can be 300 days. It can be two years. So you don't necessarily know that when you're going to hit it. So you may want to do a test long enough that you're going to hit it and be able to identify it. Once you see that the HPOIT or the OIT values are very stable, you can consider that you don't have any more antioxidants in it. Another way of doing it is uh, – no, sorry, come back. Another way of doing it is uh, by asking your manufacturer. Uh, Solmax, I'm going to speak for Solmax. We've done a lot of testing on a lot of different uh, resins. We don't have all the residual values, but we have some residual values. So we're able to know more or less when there's no more antioxidants in it. And finally, evaluate the depletion rate. <clears throat> so in conclusion, antioxidants are essential to the long-term performance of the geomembrane. You really need to have uh, some in it. There are different types of antioxidants that will serve different purposes. So don't say, I want HALs, or don't say, I want phenols, or I want phosphates. They're all important, and they're all in, they, they all serve different purposes. So depending on the application, one may be better suited than the other. Performance of the antioxidant will depend on multiple factors. There's no one size fits all. You can have a combination of uh, a given antioxidant with a given resin, and you're going to put it in a given application, and it's going to work great. You're going to put it in the different application. And you, for one, you're containing chemical A, and the other one, you're containing chemical B, and the depletion rate in chemical B is going to be sky high. But there could have been a different recipe, a different combination of, res of resin and antioxidant that would have been better and would have given you better results. So don't believe that one size fits all. Performing OIT or HPOIT tests alone is not enough to evaluate the long-term performance of the geomembrane. I can't emphasize this enough. Don't just look at that value. If as a standalone value, it doesn't mean anything. Performing accelerated aging in air, UV, liquid, and chemicals will give you a better approximation of the long-term performance. Identify the time at which the, all the antioxidants will be consumed and beware of statements such as bigger is better or more is better. Work with the manufacturer to find the best solution. We have a wealth of information as a manufacturer, and, it's, and we can work with designers to find what's the best solution. Now, a couple of scenarios here, just to put you in context. If you're doing a buried landfill cover in northern Canada, where the liner will not be exposed to liquids, UVs, or high temperatures, Standard geomembranes with typical antioxidant packages will be more than enough to meet your long-term performance requirements of the liner. Again, Kerner has done, in his uh, analysis of uh, durability of geomembrane, has done a lot of good work and found that standard HDP geomembranes, 40 mil geomembrane, I think, or 60 mil, I, I don't remember which one, um, at 20 degrees Celsius and is non-exposed can last over 700 years. And that means it will take over 700 years before the mechanical properties are half of what they were originally. So you don't need to over-design and overspend on a geomembrane with huge antioxidant packages that aren't going to be useful. To the same extent, if you're containing a very aggressive chemical at very high temperatures and you want it for a very long period, then you know you might want to consider paying more attention to the antioxidant package. 
and you want to find what's the optimal uh, antioxidant package. Here, more is not necessarily better, like I said earlier. Work with the manufacturer. We have a lot of information. Perform the proper testing. OIT, HPOIT, accelerated aging. Accelerated aging and the actual solution that the liner is going to be placed in. Calculate uh, the depletion rate and uh, the, the uh, the, the time when you won't have any more additives in it, and identify the geomembrane that's best suited for your long-term performance needs. There's different scenarios, there's different applications, there's no one-size-fits-all recipe. Um, I can also let you know that Solmax is right now conducting ex extensive testing on, um, on different resins and different uh, additives to, and, and putting them in different solutions to find those depletion rates, typical depletion rates, and to be able to assist engineers in their design. So, um, so that ends the presentation. Uh, I know that some of you asked a few questions during the presentation. If some of you still have some more, I, I'll ask you to, uh, to please write them in the chat box. Um, I'm gonna address the first one. It was from Mr. Rodrigo Silva. The antioxidants would be related to the OIT and UV resistance of the geomembrane. Um, uh, yeah, the, the antioxidants, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, the antioxidants are there to protect against oxygen, chemicals, and UV, and will give uh, UV resistance and oxidation resistance and chemical resistance to the geomembrane by preventing free radicals from being formed. The OIT and HPOIT tests are uh, standard test methods that were developed to identify the uh, amount of antioxidants that are in a geomembrane. They're an index test, so what does 100 minutes of OIT mean? What does 400 minutes mean? It means that it meets a standard uh, value, but it doesn't exactly give you the exact performance of the geomembrane. I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, you can add a, another one. Um, from Hemendra Behera, uh, sorry if I butchered the name. Can you confirm how to life calculation from OIT minutes? Well, I hope I answered it later on. So from the OIT test, uh, how to know the life calculation? Um, from the OIT test, you do an accelerated aging test and you find the next OIT value. So after having age, what the OIT value, and that's gonna give you the depletion rate. If you apply the formulas that I shared with you in the presentation, that should give you uh, when are you not gonna have any more antioxidants in the geomembrane, uh, time-wise. So that should give you an approximation. Obviously, it's accelerated aging. Real-life aging is different, uh, like, uh, the former vice president of Solmax, Mr. Bob Denis, once told me, um, boil an egg and let an egg rot, and you'll see that they don't age exactly the same. Uh, so accelerated aging has its limitations, but it's gonna give you a good idea uh, of how they're gonna perform and how long they're gonna last. And most importantly, if you're thinking of different solutions, you may wanna test those different solutions, and it's gonna give you a relative value when you compare each solutions one to another. I hope that answers your question. Uh, if you have another question, you may add it. And if anybody else has a question, you may ask away. I don't see any questions. So um, I wanna thank you very much all for participating in this webinar. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a topic that's a little complicated. Oh, I have a question from uh, William Francie. Seeing as how the weakest part of the berry system is the seams or the heat affected zone ad adjacent to the seams, do you suspect geomembrane wedge welding has the potential to substantially reduce antioxidants level in the geomembrane? It's a very good question. Um, that's another reason why you need phosphites in, in the geomembrane. When you're gonna heat the, ge the geomembrane at the seam, you're gonna heat uh, the, the liner at 400 degrees Celsius or 850 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. Um, 
you're obviously going to use very, very high temperatures, and those high temperatures are going to create a lot of free radicals. It's important to have um, phosphites or phenols in your geomembranes right there to prevent the creation of free radicals that are going to be the start of a cancer. You don't need it for a very long time because it's not going to be exposed for a very long time, but you need them. So um, absolutely, uh, wedge welding the geomembrane is going to reduce the amount of antioxidants that you have in the geomembrane. Um, but if you have the proper blend and the proper mix of antioxidants, it won't affect the long-term, it shouldn't affect the long-term durability of the geomembrane. I hope that answers your question. Is it possible to measure the reduction of a specific type of antioxidants in a geomembrane, example, endodermines? Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, yes, it does. Uh, there's a way. Um, you have to do, uh, I don't know the exact test for that. I'd have to ask our chemists, but there's ways through molecular weight distribution and through the, the scanning tools that they have to identify the actual concentration of, um, of each antioxidant there are. Those tests are very costly. Uh, those tests are not done by everybody. Um, so uh, it's not part of a typical MQC process, but if push comes to shove, for example, when we do our R&D at Solmax, uh, we're going to have, uh, we're going to refer to external labs to measure the exact concentrations of each uh, antioxidants to be able to identify the, the optimal concentration. So um, if you want, um, I, I believe I have your email address. Um, uh, I could send you the exact test that could be done uh, when I consult my colleagues uh, that are more knowledgeable on the topic than I am. Um, okay, I will send it to you. So I don't think there are any more other questions. I want to thank all of you for participating. Um, it was very, very fun for me. It's a difficult topic. Uh, if you have additional questions, um, my email address, we're going to type my email address in the chat box. Uh, you can send them to me, uh, or you can send it at uh, tsvaran at solmax.com. That's the technical box uh, for technical questions, and we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have. And in the future, if some of you have concerns, design specific situations, feel free to contact us at any time. We'll be, we have a team of experts here that are willing and happy and even paid to help you guys out. So thank you very much. And uh, I believe the next webinar will be in a couple of months and we're gonna keep it as a secret for now the topic, but hopefully it's gonna be uh, as appreciated uh, as this one is. By the way, you're gonna receive a survey from us to see if you liked it. Um, the topic itself is okay, but please say that you really like the presenter because I, I like congratulations and stuff like that. Thank you very much, everybody, and uh, see you soon. Recorder. <laughs>